So to introduce kind of a, the framework of what we're going to be talking of here at Stanford, it's really a central issue of engaging students. Um, our first group of speakers will be talking about a particular set of classes in engaging students around the ethical dimension. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to read a little bit of a quote um, from an author who wrote this about 10 years ago, faculty attitudes about ethics. Perhaps the most glaring weakness of the current state of education for engineering professionalism is at the um, widespread lack of enthusiasm for this agenda among faculty and students. Our research makes it clear that many faculty, engineering faculty have not thought much about their program's responsibility for ethical professional preparation, and many are skeptical of, of the feasibility and legitimacy of this undertaking. I'm so glad that my three presenters are really going to repudiate that quote that was written by one person named Shepard about a decade ago. Um, <laughs> the second group of presenters, Lourdes and Nathaniel, are really going to be building on what Brian ended with um, in talking about the, uh, the Minneapolis and, and the Minnesota efforts in recognizing we need to struggle with the diversity of engineering, that in the US it remains largely male and white and we can't just assume that that's going to change with time. We need to be proactive. So they're going to be talking about things beyond the classroom to think about building diversity and equity and inclusion in engineering. So with that, Tom, it's yours. Thanks, Sherry. Uh, hello, everybody. I've really enjoyed the keynote and these other presentations by our colleagues. So I will dive in. To, and by the way, no PowerPoint from uh, Brooke and me, <laughs> you can applaud, uh, but I will pop some links into the chat once we're done. So Brooke, who is a student, is going to speak in just a moment. We want to talk to you about um, some trends. I'm, I'm pretty sure you're well aware of these trends. Um, but first of all, quick history. Ethics has been, or applied ethics, has been a part of engineering education forever. I certainly studied it as an undergrad engineering student at Berkeley back in the 70s. And it was concerned about whether buildings are gonna fall down or planes were gonna fall out of the sky, of course. Um, but it has renewed emphasis as we, you're going to hear from Chris, for example, uh, who's following us about driverless cars. So, and if you've read the news any time over the last <laughs> few years or this past decade, you know it is important to bring uh, accelerate applied ethics into engineering education. Well, this is golden opportunity because I know so many of you because of my work the last 25 years in engineering entrepreneurship education. And what I mean by in entrepreneurship, of course, is the start and the scaling of organizations doing mission critical work, whether they're on their own or with, within a large organization. Well, we've had a great time establishing entrepreneurship education as now standard or expected in engineering education. Well. The, the connect here is this. There's a great chance to use that humanities-based discipline of entrepreneurship education to connect with applied ethics. And so if we connect the dots between technology education with entrepreneurship education, with applied ethics education, we can really do something special this decade. So rather than me going on about it, I, I want to introduce Brooke. Uh, she's part of the PEAK project, Principled Entrepreneurial Action and Knowledge at Stanford, which is a group of faculty and students, not only at our in own institution, but a coalition of the willing. So if you're interested, do get in touch with me. I'll, I'll pop the links on chat, like I say, and I'll turn it over to Brooke to tell you what sort of impact this is having. She is a senior in uh, getting her BS in uh, engineering. So Brooke, it's all yours. Thanks, Tom, and hi, everyone. Um, I've been super fortunate to be able to take several of these courses that go far beyond an engineer's general education requirement for ethical reasoning at Stanford um, through my involvement in the PEAK project. And these, these courses and opportunities are really shaping and instilling core values and principles for students. Um, and these learned frameworks have helped me navigate key personal decisions, and I'm confident that moving forward, they'll help inform organizational decisions as a leader and innovator. Um, and so for students, these conversations are proving really valuable and we wanted to bring them out of the classroom and empower more peer-to-peer -peer sharing. And so earlier this year, as a part of the PEAK project, 
we actually started Peak Fellows, which is a student initiated summer opportunity that brings together students working in multiple disciplines at corporations, in research labs, at startups, um, and to openly converse on real life ethical dilemmas, build their personal values toolkit and learn from the experiences of their peers and mentors. Um, and it's proven to be an important pathway in providing an experiential education of applied ethics. Back Terrific. to you, Todd. All right, great. So I'll pop a bunch of links about uh, how we're affecting not just a special program like she talked about, but also all the curriculum around entrepreneurship and innovation. But let's dive a little deeper with Chris. Chris? Great. Thanks, Tom. I'm going to actually present some visuals here. So if people want to sort of highlight my visual, uh, my window, you'll be able to read this here. I teach a course on ethics and equity in transportation systems. I, and I have to say, I've encountered exactly the sorts of challenges uh, around motivation that, that Sherry spoke of at the beginning. One of the things we thought this year is given the interest and, and passion around the racial justice movement in the US, is there a way that we can connect that to engineering ethics? And so I wanna just really quickly go through one assignment we did to make that connection. So very brief history lesson. So the 1920s were a time of considerable economic expansion in the US, followed by a series of years in which we had the Great Depression uh, and severe economic issues, not just in the US, but, but globally. In the US, however, this sparked a lot of legislation known collectively as the New Deal, where we really restructured our social systems. And part of that was uh, an organization known as the Homeowners Loan Corporation. Now, much like today, where there's concerns about people being able to pay their rent or their mortgage, uh, this was basically set up at the time of the Great Depression to provide additional home loan opportunities to keep people in their houses and expand home ownership. And as part of that, they developed what are known as security maps. Uh, so they graded cities based upon four grades, A through D. D was considered to be unlendable. And these maps looked something like this. So they were co color coded where you would have green areas where A all the way down to D areas in red. This is a map of Detroit, for instance, it was produced in the 1930s. Uh, and this produced a term which is very common in the US known as redlining when you refuse to lend to people based on the neighborhood in which they live. This was government policy in the 1930s. Now, fortunately, these maps have actually been digitized now and overlaid over modern cities. So it's now extremely easy to, to go into a city of your choice and basically see what neighborhoods were graded what level back in the 1930s. This is part of the mapping inequality program. And you can furthermore tap on these individual neighborhoods and get the rationale as for why they were graded the way that they were. And some of these are quite honestly very disturbing. Uh, so I'm going to take an example of Detroit. This is actually where Ford has the headquarters of their new automated vehicle program at the moment. And you can sort of see that they have a line for shifting or infiltration, which is sort of what they would use to talk about uh, neighborhoods that contain individuals that were going to get a low rating. In this case, uh, they demonstrated low grade aliens here. It mentioned in the description a couple of times that this area has a heavy concentration of low grade aliens and undesirable aliens finally concluding that it's the type of population that generates the fourth or unlendable uh, rating. So very clearly national origin discrimination laid out in government policy. If we go over to the, to the West Coast, things didn't necessarily get any better. Uh, this is a, an example from Oakland, where you can see that among detrimental influences, uh, there was a predominance of foreign inhabitants and again, an infiltration of Black and Asian residents in this area. You'll see that, in fact, there was a special line that had to be filled out uh, to rate the percentage of the Black population in the neighborhood. And this infiltration that caused the low rating was a matter of 1%. So we often hear in the US stories of white families chasing Black families out of neighborhoods. But what often gets admitted is the fact that government policy was to not lend to such neighborhoods. Therefore, there was really a systemic problem here. So what we did with the assignment was given the availability of this, we sent students out to pick any city that they wanted, uh, often their hometown or for international students, often somewhere in the Bay Area. And then we asked them to basically figure out were the red zones based on national origin or racial discrimination. And in fact, actually they found that in far more than 50%, I think it was probably 70% or so of the neighborhoods that they looked at individually in my sections, they were actually caused, 
causal relationships between who lived there and why these neighborhoods were rated the way that they were. Okay, so that's the racial justice part, but where does the engineering part come in? Remember, these maps are now superimposed over modern roads. And from that, we asked another question. Where are the highways running today? And do they correspond to these red and, in some cases, yellow areas? And in fact, in almost all the cities, students could see a tremendous correlation. Uh, sometimes there were issues of geography that kind of uh, distorted that. But in general, what they found was that the highways had run through exactly these red areas. So it was very clear to them that, in fact, our basic infrastructure was built on a system which was, at its core, discriminatory on the basis of race and national origin. So the whole lesson of this was really to point out that the impacts of discrimination are huge, but they're often vis invisible to us. If you think about it, these are the roads and the highways that people just tend to accept. This is our infrastructure. This is the world that we live in. But it's in fact the outcome of considerable discrimination. And so the point we wanted to make was that really engineering a better future is, uh, motivates us to look for these actively to find these impacts of discrimination and then try to address them. And so with this assignment, we actually covered a lot of the US, found a lot of these examples uh, and, and learned a lot individually about the different cities and about the students. So I think it was overall fairly successful at engaging them around a topic that's relevant to engineering and relevant to their lives. So with that, let me hand off to Lourdes. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here. My name is Lourdes Andrade, and I use she, her pronouns. In California, United States, we use pronouns to highlight awareness that um, the way that I present my gender may not be the way that I identify. I have the pleasure of working in the School of Engineering, focusing in on our diversity, outreach, um, inclusion efforts. Um, as uh, been mentioned here before, um, what we're looking at is a lens through uh, now my, 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 my slides are not moving. Uh, we're looking through a lens of a critical race theory, which means that it's not um, how do we make the student fit into the system, but how do we look at systemic issues that we have influence over to make the university a place where all students from backgrounds have a sense of belonging. So briefly, we have undergraduate programs that we run. These are our uh, summer undergraduate um, engineering academy. It's normally a residentially based experience for students to come in before school begins to build a sense of community to get to understand campus. And then we offer year round um, smaller companion classes that are for foundational engineering courses. At the graduate level, what a lot of our focus is in outreach and inclusion. So how do we make sure that we are reaching out to students from across the United States and the globe who may not have considered uh, Stanford as a place that they want to um, come in and become graduate students. Um, here's an example of some of our outreach materials. We know that representation matters. Our students of color, particularly black students, United States obviously has a very complicated history with race, um, his, just the, the racial history of, of, of the United States. We wanna make sure that we are representing students in a way that they have perhaps in the past never seen themselves represented. One of the things that we're also doing to engage students once they get here is we don't make these assumptions that because they are at Stanford that they understand all of the complexities of becoming a graduate student. So programs like Summer First, which are students, a lot of students who are incoming PhD students who may be the first in the family to attend college, or maybe came from a, a school that wasn't an R1, didn't have strong research background. And what we do is we bring them in the summer together and they meet with faculty, they learn about rotations and grants. Um, and research and they get a jump start on that and build community as well. We also have programs and community building events. We have a brand new program called Women of Color in Engineering. Again, it's trying to find community amongst engineering students and faculty, highlighting their efforts, what they're doing and bringing awareness to others who've come before them. This is an example of a program that we just did. And finally, we have um, also a student advisory graduate council. So how do we elevate the voices of students? Um, you know, the way that the faculty experienced college when they, were under, when they were grad students is very different now. So we wanna make sure that we are giving voice to all of our students and they are engaged. This is across all of the School of Engineering. Um, students report to the Dean's office and the executive committee on issues that are very relevant to grad students. 
Finally, we have also this um, awareness of um, providing support for graduate students. We partner with our Center for Teaching and Learning to provide coaching and academic skills. And okay. that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank I'll you. I'll turn it over to Nathaniel. Nathaniel, yeah. Oh. And that's our okay. last speaker, John. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Lourdes. Um, yeah, my name is Nathaniel. I'm a PhD student in the mechanical engineering department. Um, and I'll go back in time, I actually did my bachelor's also at Stanford, where I was a member of the Society of Black Scientists and Engineers, which is the Stanford chapter of the National Society, the Society of Black, <clears throat> sorry, National Society of Black Engineers. Um, and what we did in that society was to provide opportunities to support our students, um, both academically and for career planning. Um, so that involved working with other diversity societies at Stanford, as well as the School of Engineering, to host things such as study nights, um, lunch, luncheons with companies, and also career fairs. Um, and then as I transferred to my graduate career in the PhD, I joined the Black Engineering Graduate Students Association, where I worked with students and board members, and again, staff and faculty in the School of Engineering to host um, recruitment strategies where we re reached out on a nationwide basis and recruited students and brought them to campus. This year we did it virtually, but the, the purpose is to give students who are applying to grad school um, an understanding of what research is like generally and at Stanford of what their lives may be like um, as graduate students here and also a chance to connect with faculty and other students who might serve as a support network for them when they arrive. And then also as my time as a grad student here, I worked at more grassroots efforts, um, doing things such as at a research lab level, organizing outreach events between labs and also working with students across the School of Engineering and Mechanical and the Department of Mechanical Engineering um, to work with faculty in founding a recently formed committee called the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee um, that is composed of both faculty and students working together um, to improve just that diversity, equity, inclusion um, within our department, but also working to push for initiatives um, at an engineering wide level as well. So I've been grateful to work with the people here so far. And I think that brings me to time. So I'll give it back to you, Shay. Great, good. So thank, thank you, Nathaniel. Um, John, I think that wraps us up in taking a look at, at a course and a cool technology that Chris has been developing for presenting in this COVID time. And then work at the Dean's level and the departmental level of, of expanding the faces that are doing engineering and what engineering even is. So that's all for Stanford. Great, thank you very much.